Well, good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here at Meeting House Church, and we're really glad if you're joining us online. You are most welcome. As you know, we have been going through the book of James this summer, and James can be a little bit complicated because it's all about stuff we should do, how we can be in better community with one another. The passage today is going to be talking about wisdom and how wisdom leads us to peace and a hope that can sustain us. I will offer you this scripture from Proverbs that leans us in that direction and begins to set our hearts for what God has for us as we pursue God's wisdom and how that can change us and change the world. It starts like this from chapter four. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth, says God. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever else you get, get insight. Prize prize wisdom highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland, and she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So friends, as we join together in worship, point our hearts and our minds and our souls towards God. Let's get wisdom. Let's pursue insight that we might be transformed and then the world around us. Welcome to worship. Let's continue as we sing today's hymn. As we begin in worship, we start with a time of prayer, because prayer is a way for us as individuals and us as a community to connect with one another and to connect with God. So join me in prayer. God, 
It is so good to be here today, to be together and remember that we are not alone in our journeys, but that we belong to one another and we belong to you, God. Thank you for each person in this room and each person joining us online. God, we have come here this morning to learn wisdom from your word, from your Holy Spirit, and from one another. So God, teach us how to listen. Listen to ourselves, listen to others, and listen to you, God. Develop in us a sensitivity for your voice so we can train our ears and train our hearts to cut through all the noise and distractions so we may become better at recognizing your voice. Your voice that invites us to lean into our own belovedness and then calls us to be a people who cultivate that belovedness in this world. May we listen to that voice. May we listen to your voice, God. And when we get distracted, when we feel afraid, when we mess up, draw us back to you so we can try again and again and again. May we never be afraid to get back up and keep trying so we might learn to know your voice and practice listening to it. And in that listening, may we find peace and hope and wisdom. God, make us ready to hear the words spoken to our hearts this morning and grant us the courage to respond. We pray for those in need of healing in our community today, especially David Getch, Charlie Ernst, and Lynn Teschendorf. Loving God, speed their journeys to wellness. And for those in our community who are grieving, for Millie Gudermont in the loss of her mom, Ellie, Ron Backland in the loss of his brother, Dwayne, Steve Fountain at the death of his sister, Sheila, for Jeff and Mary Scott who gave altar flowers to remember and celebrate their parents, brothers, and dear friends. For all those who grieve and remember, reassure them of your presence and grant them an abundance of peace. And now, Lord, we come together and pray as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I am so excited to be with you in morning again. Welcome. Uh, my name is Nicole Smalley. I'm on the Emerging Generation staff, and this is my, my second time being in worship in a month, so I'm so happy to be with you all this morning. And I get to share with you a few things that are happening 
And pretty much this week coming up, there is something happening every single day. So there are lots of opportunities to get connected and to form some new relationships. So I'll just share a quick update about each of these things. Um, tonight at 6 o'clock is one of our backyard barbecues at the Wilhelm Garber's house. You can visit the Connection Corner if you're looking to RSVP but just haven't had a chance to yet. And then on Wednesday, we're going to have music in the courtyard here at church. Dinner's provided, and our chorale will be showing off all their talents. So come, enjoy, and spend some time listening to music together. On Thursday, we'll be having our next Theology on Tap, and we have some pictures from last month. This will be Thursday at 6 o'clock at Bear Cave Brewing in Hopkins, and it's a chance to just connect with one another, to talk about theology, to talk about beer. If you're not a beer drinker, they have really great pizza there, so there's lots of opportunities to meet some people that maybe you haven't connected with yet. On Friday, if you self-disclose as yourself in the young adult category, we are going to the Saints game, and you can connect with me if you're looking for more information about that, but another opportunity for people to form relationships, to have some fun together, whether you like baseball or you just like people watching. Um, and then... Today, as you were driving in, you likely saw that our second tiny home has been delivered. So this is with an organization called Settled, and in a week we'll begin construction on that. So if you're able and interested in grabbing your hammer, grabbing your paintbrush, and coming to help work on this home, that would be wonderful. We also need volunteers who can bring treats and snacks for the workers as well. But today, we're going to meet outside in that staff parking lot where the tiny home is and just say a prayer of blessing and dedication over that space, over that project, and for all the workers who will be volunteering their time. So right after church, you can head outside and join us for that blessing. And then lastly, all of next week, we're also going to be having an elementary day camp here at church where we'll be having a great time with kids, we'll be outside, we'll be putting up tents, we'll be doing all kinds of amazing things to show kids how beautiful creation is and how beautiful the Creator is Himself. So we're excited for that. And our fearless day camp leader is George Dornbach, who's going to go ahead and come up now as well. We're so grateful for him. And if you are a kid and you're looking to head off to God's garden, you can come join us up here on stage right now. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, so this is our time for God's garden um, where we go and head out and dive deeper into creation and, and God and Jesus and learn all of the good things. And we have Hannah and Bennett up here and any other friends. And we're going to meet some other friends from our alternative service as well. But right now we're going to sing our God's garden song, which is our send off our prayer for our day today. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Come, oh come, come to the garden. Gather round, come without fear. Known by name here in God's garden. All are welcome here. I wish my sister hugged me like that when I was younger. Let's have a great day. <laughs> Ready, friends? Awesome. Well, as they're heading off, let's say have fun kids together. Ready? One, two, three. Have fun kids. Now go ahead and stand up. Greet your neighbors. Greet those around you as you share the peace.
Today's scripture comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> making me a little worried. My friend Sean Radke, who's sitting right over there, he said, uh, I said, I better get back up to the platform. He looked, he goes, I can take over for you. So I'd like to invite Sean to come now and share the word of the day today. Let's pray. God, we are grateful uh, that you promise to be in our midst, that you promise when two or more gather in your name, there you are. And so we, with expectant hearts, look to you. Give us ears to hear eyes to see and an open mind to receive all that you intend for us in this hour and in the days to come. For we pray this in your name. Amen. That's going to be a little distracting. Well, four people were the only people on board one of those small airplanes. There was a pilot, a pastor, a Girl Scout, and the most intelligent man in the world. Suddenly the pilot returned to the cabin and informed everyone that the plane was going down. Then she let them know that there were only three parachutes on board. She said, I've got a husband and three kids at home. So she grabbed the parachute and jumped out. The rest of them looked at each other until the genius stood up, grabbed one, and he said, I'm the smartest person in the world. Grabbed the bag, jumped out. Well, the pastor, being the pastor, looked at the Girl Scout and said, you know what, I've had a good life. You have your whole life ahead of you. Young lady, you, you take that last parachute. And the Girl Scout looked at the pastor and he said, it's okay, pastor. The smartest guy in the world just grabbed my homework and jumped out the way. <laughs> There's a difference between smart and being wise. I could have an abundance of knowledge, but still have no wisdom. A lot of book smarts, but no common sense is not the best recipe for life. Every day, I personally pray for two things, wisdom and discernment, that God's spirit would lead in such a way that I would follow. Three folks were stranded on a deserted island. One, the, one day, the three of them were walking down the beach and discovered a magic lamp. They rubbed it, and sure enough, out popped a genie. The genie says, since I can only grant three wishes, you may each have one. The first one says, I've been stuck here for years. I miss my family. I want to go home. Poof, the first one returns to their family. The second one says, you know, I've been stuck here for years as well. I too miss my family. I wish I could go home. Poof, the second one gets their wish and returns to their family. The last castaway starts crying uncontrollably. The genie asks, what's the matter? I miss my friends. I wish my friends were still here. And poof, they were back. 
wisdom. Not just smarts, but how to use that intelligence in a way that's productive for ourselves and for the world. It takes wisdom. In our passage today, James encourages the reader to pursue wisdom and highlights the difference between this world's wisdom and kingdom wisdom. There's a difference, you know. James declares in our passage that true wisdom shows itself by action. And that's no surprise for us as we have been going through the book of James. We know that James is encouraging us not just to believe, but to live out what we believe, to choose action over just mental process. In verse 13, James says, who is wise? Let them show it by their good deeds. The evidence for wisdom, like faith, is seen, not just heard. It's it's not just knowing, it's doing. True wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's the process of living out what we know and then what we believe. It's not just intellectual, it's also behavioral. Biblical wisdom always brings forth fruit, which is an encouragement to us when it's applied. So regarding the Bible, we can have an abundance of biblical knowledge even, but it only translates to wisdom when we use it. Theologian Charles Spurgeon wrote, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Another commentary I read this week said, we may learn from this that genuine wisdom is ever accompanied with meekness and gentleness. Those proud, overbearing, and disdainful people who pass for great scholars and eminent critics may have learning, but they have not wisdom. Sobering words for us today, aren't they? It's also important to note true wisdom will always be accompanied with humility. On one occasion, Abraham Lincoln, to please a certain politician during the Civil War, issued a command to transfer certain regiments. When Secretary of War Edwin Stanton received the order, he refused to carry it out, saying the president was a fool. When Lincoln heard of this accusation, he replied, If Stanton said I'm a fool, then I must be, for he is nearly always right. I'll see for myself, Lincoln said. And as the two men talked, the president quickly realized that his decision was a serious mistake. And without hesitation, he withdrew it. Lincoln proved his wisdom through his humble actions. Wisdom is indeed an action word for all of us. Applied wisdom transforms us, transforms the world around us. True wisdom will show itself in humility. But in contrast, the world's wisdom is often selfish. James suggests in verse 14, as James earlier said, blessing and cursing don't mix. Neither do bitterness and envy mix with wisdom. James says that you are deceived if you think yourself to be wise, yet are envious or bitter towards others. Proverbs 16, 25 says, sometimes there is a way that seems to be right, but in the end, it's the way to death. Wisdom helps us to sort that out. Too many people think they are wise but because of their stubborn refusal to listen to wise counsel, they continue to go their way, defying truth, and end up lost or confused. I've often seen the zeal of knowledge pursued in bitterness and selfish ambition. And along this can be inflated sense of self, leading to unhealthy self-centeredness. 1 Corinthians 8 says, knowledge puffs up but love builds up. It's wisdom that helps us to sort that out and figure it out and then live it out. Because wisdom 
doesn't seek to profit itself, but focuses on the good of others. It isn't pursued through whatever means possible, regardless of who it hurts in the process. True wisdom can debate and discuss without it turning to anger and rejection. The world's wisdom is willing to accomplish its goals through whatever means, but not God's wisdom. The world's wisdom is determined to establish itself by force and would not tolerate an opposite viewpoint. The world's wisdom seeks little outside input or correction, which starkly contrasts biblical wisdom. William Barclay's commentary on James writes, he regards his opponents as enemies to be annihilated rather than as friends to be persuaded. In its selfish ambition, it focuses, its focus is to display self rather than truth and is interested more in victory of its own opinion than in the victory of truth. In its arrogance, worldly wisdom's attitude is pride in its knowledge rather than humility. The real scholar will be far more aware of what he does not know than what he does know. One could be convinced to think that envy and selfish ambition could be a good thing. How? They show passion and a desire for something better. We might say this person is focused They know what they want and they're going after it. Isn't that great? Right? Not that it's wrong to be focused and determined and opportunistic. But when envy and selfish ambition are the driving forces behind it, it will be less than what God desires for us. Like I said, the world's wisdom is often selfish. It deals with people according to what they have to offer. The world's wisdom is motivated by manipulation and deception and coercion. It seeks to gain at all costs. Many criminals are brilliant at what they do. They might be very intelligent, but are they wise? They always get caught. The world's wisdom can appear as genuine, But is it? In fact, it's likely only superficial. There can be books upon books read, and you can walk away smarter, gaining intelligence and knowledge, but not wisdom. It's wisdom that tells us what to do with what we've learned, how we've grown, and how that should be focused for the good of others. 1 Corinthians 1 says, Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you might become wiser. For the wisdom of this world is foolish with God. Paul, like James, doesn't want anyone to be deceived into thinking worldly wisdom is a good thing. Worldly wisdom is dangerous because it draws us often away from God because of our pride. We think we're so bright, we don't need God. But godly wisdom recognizes our first dependence on God. This world wisdom drives people apart. God longs to bring people together. It's why God instructed Jesus to leave the church behind. In Titus 3, Paul warns us to avoid foolish controversies and arguments and quarrels. Arguments cause division, and my pride keeps me from reconciliation. Godly wisdom, however, promotes unity and peace. It promotes us coming together as God's people to do God's work. James declares in verse 17 that there is no true wisdom apart from heavenly wisdom There's no such thing as practical wisdom that comes from this world. James says this, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. That's how we know. It's heavenly wisdom. 
Heavenly wisdom is pure, undefiled by human reasoning, rational or just, rash, rationale or justification. Heavenly wisdom is leading with humility and peace, not argument. It seeks truth. It seeks possibility. It offers hope. Albert Barnes' commentary reads, the sense is that the one who is under the influence of wisdom, which is from above, is not a stiff, stern, obstinate, unyielding person. They do not take a position and hold it, whether right or wrong. They are not someone on whom no arguments or persuasion can have any influence. They are not one who cannot be affected by any appeals which may be made to them on the grounds of patriotism, justice, or benevolence, but as one who is ready to yield when truth requires them to do it, and who is willing to sacrifice their own convenience for the good of others. Isn't that a great quote? It helps us to better understand the definition of heavenly wisdom compared to the wisdom that we often see here and no, godly wisdom is peaceable. It's considerate. It's willing to yield and full of mercy. True wisdom focuses on group accomplishments rather than just personal accomplishments. Now I said just. Personal accomplishments is good as well. Striving to be the best with what God has given us, of course. But is our accomplishments, what we achieve, does that help the greater good as well, is a question that we should always be asking of ourselves. Godly wisdom considers what will bring the greatest good for the whole, not just self. Godly wisdom is, of course, submissive to God and the leading of the Spirit. In becoming all things to all people, like the Apostle Paul, who didn't compromise his convictions, but acted wisely. Both Paul and Jesus met people where they were. They agreed to disagree at times, of course, but they didn't sweat the small stuff to be at peace with everyone. They saw the greater purpose, and Paul is often quoted saying, I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. Godly wisdom is also productive, according to verse 18. There will be forward momentum when one acts according to true wisdom. The world's wisdom measures itself by worldly terms, of course. The world's idea of success is wealth and fame and status and awards and accolades. Some of those are just fine. But God's wisdom, God's idea of success is experiencing knowing we have pleased God, helped others better understand how it is to live like Jesus and help Jesus' mission move forward. In this idea of success, being a peacemaker produces a harvest of righteousness. I stole that. I don't know where I got it, but I stole that. A peacemaker produces a harvest of righteousness. Don't you like the sound of that? A harvest of righteousness that we can be a part of producing? That means we can make a real difference in the world around us if we follow the wisdom of God. Instead of fighting and discord, which do not produce righteousness, being at peace with ourselves, being at peace with one another, being at peace with God can produce the helpful behaviors that God desires. Because when we can offer peace to others, when we're wise enough to offer peace, we help them experience God's peace for themselves and to learn to provide that peace to others. There are so many places in our lives where we need peace, don't we? We often find ourselves at odds with others, with God, even with ourselves. 
Finding peace with God helps us to experience hope that this world cannot offer. Let's stop looking to the world to offer it. Being at peace with others helps us to better pool our resources for the greater good. And being at peace with self, catch this, friends, being at peace with self allows us to know the precious gift God created us to be. We are precious gifts. Do you know that about yourself? Do you know that about others? It's wisdom that helps us to best understand that and to live out the behaviors that suggest we know that. The contrast between godly wisdom and the wisdom of the world often offer, the con, excuse me, the contrast between godly wisdom and the wisdom the world offers is significant. Worldly wisdom often acts in frustration or disappointment, but godly wisdom works in possibilities and peace. Again, from Albert Barnes's commentary, from that, the mind naturally turns to the effect of religion in general. And he states that in the ministry and out of it, in the heart of the individual and on society at large, here and hereafter, the effect of religion is to produce peace. Its nature is peaceful as it exists in the heart and as it is developed in the world and wherever and however it is manifested. It's like a seed sown, not amid the storms of war and the contentions of battle, but in the field of quiet husbandry, producing rich abundance, a harvest. There's a harvest again, a harvest of peace this time. In its origin, in all its results, it is the product only of contentment, sincerity, goodness, and peace. So happy is he who has this religion in their heart. Happy is he who with liberal hand scatters its blessings broadcast over the world. Let me read that again. Happy are they who have this religion in their heart. Happy are they who with liberal hand scatters its blessings broadcast over the world. You see, friends, true wisdom affords a hope, a peace that the world can never give us. Many are deceived into thinking that they have it all because they're smart. Friends, there are a whole lot of intelligent people who experience far less from this world than is God's desire for them. The world offers plenty of knowledge and education, but it doesn't necessarily come with real wisdom. And so, let's listen for and receive God's wisdom, wherever it may come from. This is God's creation, God's spirit as at work in us, through us, and around us. Because true wisdom from God can be gleaned in so many ways. We can even learn true wisdom from the youngest in our midst. Patrick, age 10, says, never trust a dog to watch your food. (laughs) Michael, age 14, says, when your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid? Don't answer him. (laughs) An even wiser man. When mom says, do you think my diet is working? Doesn't say a word. Randy, nine years old, says, stay away from prunes. One has to wonder what happened to poor Randy. Lauren, age nine, felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. And fingernail polish doesn't work either. Joel, 10 years old, says, never pick on your sister, especially when she's holding a baseball bat. And Eileen, age eight, wearing Band-Aids, says, never try to baptize a cat. 
there's wisdom in unexpected places. Little gems that the Spirit brings so that we can learn and grow into the fullness of what God desires for us. Intelligence, as important and valuable as it is, doesn't always produce the wisdom that God desires for us. A humble heart seeking God might get us there. Of course, being smart and intelligent has advantages. I'm not telling us not pursue intelligence. But we should seek together, individually, is the wisdom from above. If we lack godly wisdom, we ultimately will gain little. So friends, let's go from our worship this day as we have pointed our hearts and our minds towards God with a desire of seeking the wisdom from God, that wisdom which can produce a lasting hope and peace in each of us and through us for God's world. Amen? Amen. Lord God, we are grateful for these words from James that encourages us to be in the world but not of the world. And what we mean by that is, yes, to take all that this world has to offer in helping mold and shape us, but ultimately looking to you to put those final, those final touches that help us to resemble that which you call us to look like, to act like, to be like. And ultimately, God, we pray for that wisdom that help us to become more like your son, Jesus, and all that that means. For we pray this in your name. Amen.
it's uh, amazing the, the talent that's a part of the life of this church. Uh, our group that was going to be here today, quick service, uh, quick service, quick, quick. I'm back to backyard Bible club now again. Uh, quick silver, uh, we're not able to be here, and on the spur of the moment, we called Chris and. She and Debbie put that piece together, and we're so grateful. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. As we think about generosity this morning, and we think about how we can be wise with what God uh, has given to us, we have this wonderful friend and wonderful facilities uh, partner here at the church, Bob Dom, who's been with us, I don't know, a dozen or so, maybe 15 years. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> He's great at helping us keep this building going, but he also has a lot of other gifts, abilities, and talents and skills. And he had the opportunity to use some of those other uh, gifts and abilities to make a difference in some people's lives. And so we thought we'd have him come and share a little bit about how he was generous with what God has given him and what's that done for others. Bob? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Steve Coleman, a friend of mine from this congregation, many of you know, is involved with Sanctuary Church in their Love Minneapolis uh, efforts, and they they share a parking lot with a liquor store, and they're at the location of Broadway and Lindale in North Minneapolis. It's the most violent intersection in the Twin Cities, and it's because of that liquor store and this parking lot. So they asked, you know, we need some, we, we want to do raised beds, raised garden beds across one end of the parking lot to keep people from tailgating there, and then they had concrete beds that they put throughout the parking lot to control the traffic. And so I just helped them source the materials, the beds and the soil, told them how much to get, and these are the beds here. And they were very inexpensive. Um, they cost $15 for each bed, and they had 15 of them. So, um, and they're, the woman who's doing this said to me, this is a, a battle I'm fighting with plants. So, you know, they're very much, they're stepping out in faith. And what, I did very little here, but the rewards that I got were huge. I, you know, I got to help them in their mission, help the, God in his mission in the world, and I, what I've learned through this and other forms of giving is what you give, God multiplies, both directions. And so it's kind of fun. It's like a personal loaves and fishes experience every time. You know, I put a dollar in the collection plate, and I, I'm moved to tears sometimes because I can't wait to see what God will do with that, with one dollar. And God will magnify that, and it, it continues. The money I gave years ago is still rolling through, doing good. Oh. So it's, it's just a lovely experience, and it's intimacy with God. It gives me a glimpse of what heaven might be like. <laughs> Bob, before you quit, what, what's, what's your other business? When you're not here helping us, what's your other business? I own a small organic lawn care and garden business, um, <laughs> so we... We make people's yards safe for them and their kids and pets to be in. Um, I've lost family members to cancer because of ag chemicals. So this is a fire in my belly of a way of helping people be safe. So if you're ever maybe at the state fair or you're walking down the street and you hear, organic Bob, yeah, that's Bob Down. Yeah. Bob, thank you uh, for the ways that you have showed us how by being generous with what God has given us, the knowledge, the wisdom that we have, and passing it along can make such a big difference. That's a great encouragement to all of us. So as thanks. we think about, yeah, thanks. So as we think about that story and we think about our own lives, let's think about how God has equipped us in so many ways, and let's think about how we can use those same gifts that God has given us to make a generous contribution to the world around us. Of course, we'd love for you to continue to invest. I'm going to have to talk to Bob about that $1 he's been giving. But uh, I guess it, what you give is up to you. Uh, 
But we'd love for you to continue to invest in the work that we're doing and the ministry that we're doing as we continue to teach scripture, as we continue to love kids, and as we continue to do missionally in the world what God calls us to do. And you can do it in a lot of ways. You can give online, you can, you can text it, you can put a check in the box any way that you want to do it. We will receive it. So let's pray a blessing on God's generosity and how we use it for God's purposes. God, thank you for that story of our beloved Bob and how he continues to live generously for the good of the world around us, using what he has learned and collected and then offered it to others, that it can transform their world. We know as we live generously, you'll use us in powerful ways. So bless our efforts and bless these gifts for your kingdom work. For we pray this in your name, amen. Let's stand if you're able, let's sing our last hymn together. together. We're glad that you've come. We're glad that you've joined us online. We would invite you to come join us if you're not far away someday in the meeting house with us together. We'd love to greet you. If, when you walk out of the meeting house today, you'll notice that there are no table, no coffee, no donuts because they're outside. <laughs> so you might go out there, grab a cup of coffee, maybe a donut hole or two or three is whatever you can get on your napkin. And then maybe let's head over to the tiny house, which is going to be right over there in the staff lot. Say a couple words, and I'm going to say a prayer over it, and we'll pray together that God will not only bless our efforts as we produce that tiny house, but bless all who will live in that house as they escape chronic homelessness and live in community with one another. Really fun to be in worship with the Emerging Generation staff member. 
and also with our wonderful deacon. Glad to be here with you as well. I will end with what we began with as we go from this place seeking the wisdom from God. Friends, get wisdom. (laughs) Get insight. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of God's mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland, and she will bestow on you a beautiful crown, a radiant crown that one day will throw at Jesus' feet celebrating all of what God has done in and through us. Go in the knowledge that if we seek that wisdom, God will give it and lead us and guide us by it. And the world will be better for it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.